Okay, John, thanks for talking to me. Um, I, I guess um, I'll let you do the introduction yourself and just quickly tell, tell me how you got started in this business because originally you were an engineer, right? That's right. That's right. So um, I had a chance encounter with uh, Badminton Kaki. Uh, he was a lawyer by training and uh, he introduced me to value investing after I lost so much money and uh, I took up classes, read a lot. And uh, here I am today, I just suddenly discovered a passion for stocks uh, and I want to help the retail investor actually. Okay, so FIRO, right? Um, F-I-R-L, yeah. what, what does it stand for? It stands for financially uh, uh, financially independent, uh, finance in real life, sorry. It actually takes the acronym from financially independent and retire early. We don't believe in early retirement because we love what we do. So <laughs> that's why finance in real life. <laughs> okay, so, so I guess... I guess the whole premise behind my channel is to try and give the, the younger guy, right, or the, the novice investor yeah. a bit of a leg up, right? So a bit more, a bit of advice in terms of, of how they should approach investing, you know, make as few mistakes as possible. Um, what, what, are, what are the top, top, top three things you would advise the novice investor to, to know uh, at the outset of their journey? Yeah, great question, Chuang. I think... Uh, we, today we are we're, we're living in a world where there's tons of information and tons of uh, ways to dis disseminate the information. So I think the first tip that any retail investor should really uh, be aware of is you always need to verify whatever news or tips because there's no such thing as free lunch. And even if it's a really well-intentioned tip or a message from uh, a friend or a family friend, right? Why not just verify it first? And I think today uh, it's not so much an information arbitrage of internet and uh, uh, dissemination, but it's more of a skills arbitrage, which is which, which leads me to my second tip, actually. The struggle for most people is that they are bombarded with all this information, but they do not know how to analyze and segregate this. That, that that's, that's the struggle for most retail investors because they get reports, they get uh, Facebook messages, they get online tips from gurus and all that, but they do not know how to analyze. It's more of a skills arbitrage rather than... Uh, information arbitrage i mean in the past you think about it you think about it 20 30 years ago the media was controlled very controlled but today with uh, internet it's very easy for you to verify your source you know of information okay so the first yeah, one is I think to, the, yeah so the first one is to to, know, to to disseminate to make a difference between uh, what you hear uh, as a tip or speculation and then the second yeah. thing is to do your own research right that's right to to have the skills to do your own research i think today uh it's very easy for you to go online. Uh, there are a lot of financial data aggregators. Uh, when I say financial data aggregators, things like Yahoo Finance or, or uh, investor sites like Share Investor or Marketplace, where you get financial data to analyze a public listed company. The struggle for most people is not so much to afford and to get on those sites. The struggle for most people is to understand how to do it. And I think that's where the retail investor need that leg up, like what you said, you know, that, that skills that, that uh, to, in, to enable them to understand all this, I guess. Okay, then what's the third, the third thing? Yeah, the third thing is always remember that we are always biased. As a re anybody, whether you're a professional investor or a retail investor, you're always biased. So whenever you take in or sink in information, right, and you already own the stock, you're, you're automatically biased to want to find information or, or data that correlates with your investment decision. As a retail investor, you should actually find data that does not validate whatever your investment decision is so that you get you get both sides of the story, both sides of the coin. And I think that's where even uh, professional investors today, the, the really good ones, they are not trying to be right. They're trying to be accurate by having a very good mental model, by knowing that the facts actually validate rather than support their bias. I think that's a, that's a skill that I think you only can acquire over time, lah. Experience, you know, someone like you in a journalist world, you've seen them all, right? You've seen <laughs> sometimes you you take a bias to a certain decision, and then two years later you discover certain facts, certain uh, opinions. They say, "Hey, I wasn't too right with my opinion or my bias two years ago." I think that that's something that a retail investor can really get a leg up when when they understand that they have their own biases. Huh? I think that that's key. Huh? The three the three things. Okay, but so. Yeah, yeah. But, but a lot of people, they either they don't have the time or the inclination to do their own research, right? Why don't they just leave it yes. to the professional? Oh, uh, very good question. I think the professionals, they have their own struggles. Like, for example, if a fund size, right, uh, it becomes so big, right, there are a lot of times this, there's little known companies or little known 
uh, uh, businesses that are out of the radar of these guys. And let's just say if you have a, a fund manager that has a fund size of a, a, a billion and he looks into a public listed company, the market cap of this company is probably like 40, 50 million, right? And there is a mandate by this fund manager that he cannot hold, uh, uh, he would not be able to invest in such a small market cap company. And these are where I think the retail investors can leverage on their, their nimbleness, I would say, to try to, to try to find this arbitrage to be able to, to buy those companies that these fund managers cannot do. That's one. Second thing is most fund managers, and uh, I know when I say this, it's going to cause a little bit of controversy. They like to hunt certain indexes because ultimately it's short terminism by a lot of their investors. They need to make sure that they have to beat the index. And they are not uh, very willing to take that kind of risk to be able to be negative because the investors will flee. Whereas for a retail investor, you do not have that kind of um, you do not have that kind of pressure to perform every year, year in, year out. You know, you must be able to say, hey, there are some years that I, I bought this company, uh, business may be do not doing so well, but I'm okay to take the, the, the hit. But then in years uh, where there is a bull market, right, the opportunities will allow itself to, to you know, the market will come to its uh, mean regression. Uh, and that's where you really make it as a retail investor. I think there are a lot of advantages for the retail investor as compared to the fund manager. And I, I, I agree to to certain extent, some people don't like to manage money. They like to abdicate. Go to the fund manager, for sure. But then if you're expecting um, better than average returns, I think this is where you need to train yourself and to uh, to level up your skill to be able to find that alpha, lah, to be able to get the returns that is better than a fund manager. And then, you know, there's a reason why companies are that size, right? 40, 50 million ringgit market cap also means that they have also got every chance of failing. Um, that means the risk level is higher. Um, and a lot That's of these right. companies also are also value traps, right? Uh, they can yes. be going nowhere for the, for the longest time, even though the numbers look amazing. How do you overcome that? Correct. Oh, very good. Uh, the, actually, it, it relates to the second thing about learning skills arbitrage. Um, one, one of the things I enjoy as an investor, especially as a retail investor, is actually talking to people. And the, the value traps that you mentioned, right, you, you shouldn't just analyze a company just from an annual report because that's just a photograph. It's just a snapshot of the business for that year. And they may not be painting you the full picture. And what I do enjoy doing is this process that was coined by this uh, um, investor in the 1930s. It's called Philip Fisher. He, 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 term, he coined this term scuttlebutt. And scuttlebutt, one of the methods of scuttlebutting is actually the company that you want to invest in, you should talk to the competitors. Why are they afraid of the company that you're investing in? If they're not afraid and they said this company is lousy, then you've already got a validation source. Oh, there may be a value trap that you're not seeing on the annual report. The second thing is, how do you know that industry inside out? I mean, like, for example, uh, I, a, a good example would be the publishing companies, Star Media Group, right? I mean, you've seen their readership from 1.2 million in the 1990s, early 2000s, drop to about 200, 300,000 today. They're virtually struggling, right, to, to gain a revenue source. But a lot of people don't understand that a printing license, a, a license to publish is actually a very expensive commodity but yet they have not been able to monetize or to make it, uh, to, to turn it into a revenue generating source. One way is they, they have paywalls for subscription and all that kind of thing. But how many people are willing to pay for news today? So you see, those are the kind of things that are value traps. And as, a, uh, as an investor, you need to dig deeper to understand, talk to people in the publishing industry, talk to people, how, can, how else can they monetize the printing license that's so valuable to them? I think this is where, um, retail investors really need to upskill rather than just hearsay surface information and i think it's a con constant learning machine um, uh, habit that you have to form and you have to have some kind of love for it lah. because if you don't if you don't like what you're doing right investing right might as well just put it in the fund manager lah. then you abdicate everything but then don't don't complain about the the returns that you're getting oh, and don't complain about the fees that you're also paying oh. <laughs> because there's not there's no such thing as free lunch but if you enjoy it i mean you enjoy the thrill of talking to people, understanding businesses, and then, oh, oh, you see things with a different lens. You see you, you see the same world, but you have a different lens altogether. And, and that's what is really amazing. I mean, uh, there was one time, um, my wife thought I was a bit crazy. I was talking to the Nestle promoter. She was selling Milo. So I was asking her, hey, how long is this campaign? How fast does the shelf go out? And all that kind of things. I mean, I enjoy it. I mean, it, it's not too difficult. A lot of people think it's rocket science. You need to have a CFA. But you'll be surprised the most common sense way of analyzing a, a business 
is the one that actually gives the retail investor the most advantage actually. Okay, last question. Um, there's yeah. a lot of different kinds of investing, right? And some yes. more, more popular ones could be, say, momentum investing, okay, where you just yes. go with the flow and it's like basically funds flow, right? Interest rates and what have yeah. you. Um, is there still a place for value investing when obviously a lot of shares have gone up? It's huge amounts of money, huge amounts of gain. Oh, money. yeah. Yes, yes. I think um, there's this theory, in the, uh, especially in the finance academic world, it's, it's about the efficient market hypothesis. And it says that because of the dissemis- dissemination of information today, the markets are always efficient. And uh, you need to follow momentum. Uh, the value investing doesn't work. You have to go for growth investing, all this kind of thing. I think uh, it's more of a marketing ploy. People try to differentiate dividend investing, value investing, and growth investing. When, when we look at value investing, virtually what are we doing? We are looking at price arbitrage, the difference between price and value. Whether you call it growth, whether you call it dividend, whatever, there's always a place when there is something of value that is priced at 50 cents, uh, uh, priced at 50 cents, but the value of it is $1. That basically is what we're doing. You do it in real estate. You do it in whatever asset class, cryptocurrency. Uh, okay, cryptocurrency, I, 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 I'm not too, too much of an expert. And... Uh, even properties. So what we are doing virtually is getting the leg up in trying to understand price arbitrage. When you have that price arbitrage, it always works to your advantage. That's the essence of value investing. So I believe even 200 years from now, whatever asset class that exists, if you have the skill to price arbitrage, that is value investing actually. Okay, man. Good stuff. Thank you for talking to me. Yeah. Okay. Great, great. Thank you for having me, Chuang.